to get that message across, we use these like forms and symbols and shapes. And by doing that through our art and through our, our design, we're creating the narrative of what we're doing. And with tattooing, the limitations has created this amazing aesthetic. And he encouraged me. He's like, look, there's a way. I think you have something to offer. And then for the last 10 years, he's been trying to get me to stop tattooing. <laughs> <laughs> With simplicity, you have purity. My name is Steph Bastian. In my 10 years on the road, I've met many unique characters in the tattoo business, and they all have one thing in common, incredible stories. Stories of past times, personal growth, priceless experience, and of course, bizarre happenings. I want to share those stories with you. This is Tattoo Tales. How are you? I'm doing great. Considering yes. all the craziness that's happening, I'm doing well. Well, thank so you good. so much for what you've done. This, uh, the benefit was amazing. No, and thank I, you for I joining. Believe, man. I can't believe how much, um, how much you raised, and uh, you know all the work that went into it, man. What what a huge undertaking. Thank you, man. I, I, honestly, you know, I didn't expect that because I've done it already a couple of years, and my expectations were much lower. I said, okay, maybe I don't know. Hopefully, we can do like thirty thousand, whatever. You know, and then it was more than double, and it blew my mind. The thing is, it's something that is close to everybody. Yeah, you know, to, to their heart, you know, because we're all in the same shit everywhere. Everybody wants to help. One of the most beautiful things when I look back at those things, right? When you're doing them, it's a, it, I do pretty much all of my own. So it's a lot of work, but you don't see it while you're in the middle of it. But after you can, you know, process. And right. the thing that gets stuck with me, apart from the money or the artistic uh, side of it, is the attitude of the people. You know, the thing that struck me the most is how everybody artists and uh, magazines and uh, people buying stuff or commenting stuff you know they're all on the same page on the same vibe of you know just goodwill and and you know they're keen to do everything they can it's just just incredible yeah yeah it's it's really amazing the tattoo community you know it's always kind of been regarded as like a fringe outside outsider kind of thing with like outlaws and stuff like that but i've always noticed since i started tattooing that the tattoo community always kind of rises to the occasion and uh, helps in a lot of ways. Because I think uh, by tattooing, you're connected to so many different kinds of people. You know, yeah. like we know all these people that work in hospitals and that have to go through this incredible situation. And, um, you know, I think we appreciate that maybe more so than a lot of people that would never have kind of contact with all these different kind of, you know, cops, firemen, EMTs. We tattoo all kinds of people and we develop pretty close relationships with a lot of those types of people we spend a lot of time with them your average tattoo takes more an hour you know multiple sittings you know you're spending a lot of time so you're getting to know like a lot of the ins and outs of these people's lives so you develop like deeper connections with your clients and I don't know. I, I think we're connected in a different way to, than a lot of other trades might be. Less superficial, I guess. The other thing is, you know, because you said outlaw and stuff, outcast and stuff, I think that today is a bit different. And obviously, not everybody comes from the same place. But in general, you know, it used to be this job, whatever, you know, this craft. It used to be coming from a middle slash lower class. You know, mm -hmm. you wouldn't have somebody that is a lawyer and decides to become a tattooer all of a sudden. So I think that perhaps because of that, a lot of people can relate to what it means to have struggles. Perhaps you've gone through that, you know. So I think yeah. that we might be open to help because we're like, I know what it means, you know, to go through financial struggle or whatever. So maybe we're more disposed to be like, oh, I feel you. You know what I mean? Yeah, we yeah, many of us haven't come through like academia. A lot of tattooers I know had to have blue collar jobs before they started tattooing or waitresses or waiters kind of used to having to work hard and, and live paycheck to paycheck and be in debt and things like that. So, yeah, we're not coming from like a, a weird elite situation, you know? Yeah. And uh, so how long have you been tattooing, Robert? Uh, 22 years now. And how did it start? Um. A, a good friend of mine, Mike Schweiger, he learned the tattoo. It was somebody that I was uh, playing music with and 
skateboarding with and we're very close friends he went away to art school uh dropped out his first semester learned how to tattoo at a tattoo shop in savannah georgia came back to new jersey and started tattooing all his friends and i got really into it through him he opened the shop i became his assistant and then he taught me how to tattoo how was it back then Oh, it was so wild. It was, the tattoo scene, I loved it, you know, and I still love it, but it was a lot different because it wasn't informed by anything but tattooing. You know what I mean? Like, there was no outside interference at all. No one even wanted to touch it, you know? To go into a tattoo shop was like a leap of faith for almost anybody that wasn't coming from that world, you know? So it was completely insider, you know? Like, all the lingo, all the smell, everything about it was like, all, every sense was peaked when you come into a tattoo shop. The smell of the green soap, the sound of the machine, visually stimulating. Nowadays, it's a little bit more, you see it on TV, you see it on the internet, you, you have a lot more exposure to it, but it was so raw back then, you know? So, um, and it, especially in New Jersey, because the outlaw biker thing was really, really embedded into the tattoo scene in my area. So to go into a tattoo shop, you were definitely going to tangle with them serious outlaws i'm not an outlaw i was never a biker or anything like that but i love to live like vicariously through that world because it was just so counter to anything that i had ever experienced yeah i remember when i was getting my first tattoos i got my first tattoo like you know we did it we'd have poked in, in the bathroom with my friend at 13 and then at 15 you go to like somebody's house whatever and then when i started getting my first shop tattoos i was 18 <laughs> And uh, I remember, first of all, I didn't know what to expect because I had no idea, you know, because you couldn't see what a tattoo shop looks like unless you go inside, you know. And I was a little bit scared and nervous, you know, because there were all, all like sketchy characters that in my town, in my city, we all knew them by name or fame or whatever. Sure. And the guy that started tattooing me was a, he wasn't a biker, but he was a hooligan. So same sort of like, you know, dangerous individual on another level, you know. So you would go in there and you, I remember like, oh, I have to be careful what I say, how I say, because it might beat me up. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, yeah. The same way, like I felt when I went to my first hardcore show at um, CBGB's, you know, like I knew like I was very careful about what I wore or about what I said. I kept a real low profile because I knew there was danger there. And you don't want to cross anybody. And, you know, there were these like legends you know in the pit it was in a bad neighborhood just everything about it going to the bowery in new york city reminded me of my first time going to a tattoo shop as well and I, i've always been kind of obsessed with the criminal uh language whether it be through like the drug scene or at the time in the united states when like uh, homosexuals and drag queens were being persecuted they had their own language even these secret societies like the masonic languages and stuff like that all these kind of like outlaw occult languages that was happening in the tattoo shop too if you sat and listened to a bunch of tattooers talking you had no idea what they were talking about <laughs> yeah which is pretty <laughs> Yeah. And because of the, the contact with all the different weirdo people that would come in and out of a tattoo shop, there was just this like weird magnetism to, to those experiences, especially the, the earliest ones that I had. Yeah. Do you remember the first tattoo that you ever seen? No, not in a shop, like in general in your life. Yeah, I was really, uh, I'm sure I'd seen a few maybe like uh, I had an uncle that had one, but it didn't really like even register to me till much later on. The one that the first ones that really struck me were on a guy that lived on the border of my my middle school so sixth grade i think it was well you know what i have to I have to go back a little bit there was a tattoo shop on the way walking to my uh my grade school i had to pass a tattoo shop which I, but and i was really interested in what was going on in there but i didn't even really understand what it was but the first tattoos that really struck me were the guy that lived on the he was neighbor to my school, and he was actually Tom DeVita's floor guy, and his wow. name was Fred Clouston. So the first tattoos that really struck me was Fred's tattoos, because he would he uh, he didn't cover them up, and he was the first guy I'd seen that had sleeves, so had a lot of tattoos, and it was DeVita's work, so it was really heavy. I didn't know what made his tattoos different than anything else back then, but I knew there was something about it. You know, there was like a real. Uh, real emblematic look to his arms and it always struck me and I, I passed him every day he was always out in his backyard I'd see him in the grocery store 
this like heavily tattooed guy. And then years later, I found out that he worked with Tom and he was his best friend. They lived together. Today is different because today even kids see tattoos already on on a model, on a poster, you know, whatever. So already they you break that taboo. But before, the cool thing is that at least that's what I remember, which reminds me of a bit of what you're saying, is when I saw the first tattoos that I've seen when I was a kid, and I, it was on hooligans again because they were the the rough guys. We have a we have another thing where I come from in Florence. It's called Calcio Storico Fiorentino. It's a very old sort of a medieval sport that is played only in my city and it's a cross in between mma rugby and football it's incredibly violent wow it's incredibly heard. violent and because it's a it's an historical it's an historical game that has been played since 1400 right and it, it's a game that basically gladiators used to play to warm up before getting in, into the arena oh i see and basically you have i can't remember exactly how many but I think 20, 22 players per team. You have four teams, which we used to represent the four neighborhoods of the city, right? And basically, you have to put the ball under the net. And you can run with the ball in your hands. You can kick, you can throw it. And people can stop you any way they want. So basically, what happened is that there is no uh, protection. There is no gloves. Basically, people fight, you know? So you have, like, stand-up <laughs> fighting and then grappling. It's insane, man. And I, and I grew no, up no. in the square. The ball in the net is just like an excuse to, to, to beat on each other. <laughs> Pretty much, man, because because I everybody knows somebody that plays that game because everybody can play. If you're tough enough, you go there, like, I want to play. You know, they test you. If, you. if you're tough, you play, you know. Right. So everybody has some friends that play that stuff. And the thing is, you know, to play that stuff, you need to be a little insane, you know, because it's yeah. very violent. Yeah, you have all these, these characters which are... They're all bouncers, they're all boxers, they're all crazy problematic people, you know. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's attractive but scary at the same time. And I remember seeing tattoos on these people, right, which were tribal because we didn't have so much culture like, like the States. So the, the, the most widespread thing was the tribals. Sure. And I remember that by see, like seeing those as a kid, even if you don't know what it is, but I think that we have ingrained on our DNA, some sort of like collective subconscious, this memory of what tattoos are, which is something in human culture that has been around forever. And you react to that, even if you don't know what it is or never seen one. It has some sort of like raw power that you don't know what it is, but you're attracted by it either one way or another. Even it's scary or it's attractive or it's pretty, but it moves you. You know, you see it as yeah. like, whoa, you know? Yeah, that, that's a that's like a, I hundred percent agree with that, and uh, it, you see it in like children's reactions to tattoos. You know, they're always kind of like they go right up to them and they start touching them and like want yeah. to figure it out and like yeah, I think they're I think we have an imprint. Um, you know, I believe in reincarnation, so there's there's that whole aspect to it as well. But just scientifically, I'm sure we're it's embedded in our DNA because we've been doing it for as long as time as it, as it has existed. The oldest remains have markings, you know? So I think, I think it's definitely come through us, you know, and, and it, it's been nurtured this whole time. So we have that like uh, primal or, uh, you know, just like that reaction to it. It's part of us. You know, even if you bypass the intellectual explanation of it, it moves something in you, you know, it's so, it's so crazy. So, where did you go from that? Like from when you, you started that shop, how was that? Did you manage to, to get to meet or to know over time other people that were passing through tattooers or how was it? Yeah, it was, it was really cool. At that time, uh, New York City was illegal, you know, and we were, were bordering to New York City. So New Jersey being legal, a lot of people would come from the city to get tattooed and the tattooers in New York City were underground and you, you developed a very quick relationship with them because they were so small there wasn't a lot of them so instantaneously you have this connection new york new jersey so you meet the new york tattooers the, you know the mike profeto and tom davida and those guys and getting so and i started getting tattooed at um east side inc which was an underground shop in new york and that's where i met dan Higg. i actually met him on the street i had seen his band play and he passed me on uh, Second Avenue. Me and Mike, actually Mike, who taught me, we were, uh, I think we were record shopping up there. And uh, we had passed him. I was like, that's Dan Higgs. So we went up to him and we asked him if we actually followed him into a shoe store. Like totally stalked him, you know, and uh, 
We're like, you know, I saw your band play last week. It was great. Are you tattooing while you're here? You know, because I knew that you lived in Baltimore. And uh, he said, yeah. So I, he gave us a card. We called. We had to get like, uh, you know, had to call when we got to the city to get rung in to this building because it wasn't, you know, it was out operating clandestine. You know, it was illegal. So it was a speakeasy, speakeasy style. And uh, so I started getting tattooed by him. You know, I met him. He was really influential. And, you know, I started getting a lot more work from him. And he definitely, at that time, I was still just an assistant. But I was starting to paint flash. And I was taking a lot more interest in it. And he actually encouraged me to start tattooing. Um, you know, I was kind of on the fence about it. I was At the time, I was 22. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. You know, yeah. maybe even, I might have been 21 at that time. I was playing music and selling weed and having a pretty decent lifestyle outside, outside yeah. of the tattoo shop. So I wasn't sure if I wanted to commit to tattooing at that time. And he encouraged me. He's like, look, there's a way you'd be able to, like, make a living. I think you have something to offer, you know. And, and he, he, he encouraged me to do it. And then for, subsequently, for the last 10 years, he's been trying to get me to stop tattooing. <laughs> Getting around like, are oh, you still doing that? You know, it's more of a in a joking. It's your fault. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, obviously, Dan Higgs has been influential for so many people. And what would you say, in your own opinion? Because obviously, everybody's going to have different views. But yeah. what what would you say, in your opinion, is the the thing that he brought the most that he made him so unique that it's hard to replicate? I think you know, it, it's probably gonna. It, it might go off on a tangent because there's a, a few different things. Primarily, aesthetically, he was able to strip down the American tattoo to its raw foundation and get the most out of the least amount of clutter. His uh, his approach was just purity and simplicity, you know, in each design. And I think that, you know, it took a while for that to catch on because at the time when he was doing it, people were starting to do some of the most dynamic, complex tattooing, you know, like single needle was super popular. So people were starting to get really good at single needle. Jack Rudy was kind of at, at his apex, you know, where people are starting to rec like Jack Rudy was starting to become like a, um, a household name. Everybody knew who Jack Rudy was through his flash. You know, he was like the best portrait guy. And then you have Dan Higgs doing like seven or eight lines in a tattoo design, you know, <laughs> at, so, it, it, it was a dichotomy, not that one's better or worse. I just think people started to see like, oh, wow, there, 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 there can be a different approach to this. You know, and then the biomechanical thing was very popular at that time as well. That was starting to take off. Guy Aitchison was like probably, you know, one of the more popular tattooers at the time. We're talking about like 92, 93, you know, 94, like early to mid 90s. And uh, I think Dan was aesthetically able to really break down a design to just what it needed for it to really be powerful and then philosophically he was able because of his vocabulary he's such a smart person and so steeped in like occult traditions he was able to bring this like esotericism to tattooing that was always kind of under the surface but he was able to like really bring it out and like wow this is this is like a you know, a lot of the symbolism that's being used in these tattoos has been around a lot longer than the tattoo scene, you know, and he really brought the occultism, the tattooing. So not only did he bring the aesthetic traditional power and, uh, you know, just like that, the really just stripped down essential foundation of, of a tattoo, he also brought the spirit to it as well. So I, th I think... Those two things, he no one's done better than him, but he's inspired so many of the people to go in that direction. And you see, it's like, almost like he's the root, and then all these other people, like myself and a lot of other people that tattoo similar, are, are the branches. It reminds me, uh, there's a friend of mine, Omar Edmondson, as well, when he, he was talking about when he met Dan and stuff. And uh, he says something similar. And I think that it's a beautiful thing, what you just said, because it really represents the the foundation, the spirit of traditional, which is like saying the most with the least. And uh, he was saying in a way, kind of like similar to what you said, something like he would strip things up to a point where every single line would have a, a reason to be. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if it wouldn't, it would just go. And it's yeah. so, it's so, 
uh, at least in my opinion, it's it's uh, synthesis is one of the hardest thing to accomplish because it's so it's so easy to like keep adding, but to you know subtract up to the point where you just left with a pure message, it's it's it takes years. Or Man, a special. That's why I I really love that thing that you had written. My child could do that, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, Man, I, I really thought that that was probably one of the best explanations of traditional tattoo design that I've read in by anybody. He really did a good job of presenting it because a lot of people look at it and it's the same way that they write off abstract expressionism too. You know, there's like, oh, anybody could do that. But if you really look at the guys that are doing that kind of work, you know, um, who are making those kind of paintings, there's so much intention and energy and love that's going into that work that makes that separates them than someone who's just splattering paint on it you know yeah and it's the same way like really like improvisational free jazz music and the guys who were the best at it were the ones that learned all the standards and learned how to play their instruments properly before they started stretching it out you know and like i, I feel the same way with, with traditional tattooing like Dan also, when he started tattooing, he was tattooing Greg Irons designs and was doing Judy Parker flash and stuff like that, just like all of us. Like we all learned on uh, Cherry Creek, you know, tattooing those yeah. designs. It's yeah. like really difficult, you know, walk in tattoos. You have to kind of go through that to get back to the core, you know? Yeah, learn the rules before you can break them, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's so. When I when I wrote that thing, is I was inspired because I was in Madrid and I went to a museum. And they have like very nice section about modern art and stuff. And then I went to the bookshop in there and I found this book on uh, Art Brut. And that stuff is so interesting because, like you were saying, you know, a few strokes and people that don't understand it, they might like Picasso, so to speak, right? They will say, mm -hmm. oh, everybody can do that. But I started to understand this even more when I started studying anatomy, anatomy drawing, right? And it's not really about anatomy, at least that course that I'm doing. It's not about learning every single muscle. It, teach you, it teaches you how to draw through that. And the beautiful thing is that the foundation of this approach or this guy is gesture and structure, right? Which go hand in hand. And especially in the gesture, when you do those uh, academic exercises where you have to draw, let's say, a person in front of you, whatever, a model, in 30 seconds or in a few strokes, right? Gesture is at least in my understanding gesture is the movement is the intention in the pose right and it's very hard to capture that's why you need to practice and practice and practice that's why when some people manage to capture that which is just the pure spirit of the action that is happening or the feeling of the when they manage to capture that with four strokes that's why they're so great because you know you're like oh my kid could do that no you couldn't do that in 200 strokes Right. You know? And th and this guy can and he can in five, <laughs> you know. Yeah, exactly. So, but it's hard to understand if you don't go through that process of trying and, and understanding what gesture is and what the expression of, you know, shapes and forms. And Yeah, to me, gestural um, composition is mimicking nature, like how simple the wind can take a leaf and the beauty of that, you know, or how a wave naturally crashes. You know, that's your finger wave, you know. A lot of people get stuck on the, the form of a finger wave, you know, and, you know, it's got to do this and do this. But when you actually look at the way the wave crashes, it's just like the chaos of that, you know, or just the, the natural beauty of that. When someone captures that in their, in their finger wave, that's when it's success. It's the energy, yeah. I was talking about this the other day with a friend because he was asking me like an opinion on a painting that he did, Japanese stuff. And even if Japanese is not my thing, but I've been working a royal tattoo for almost 10 years on and off and with people, you know, very experienced. So I could see, and there is a specifically a guy that I used to work with, which is one of the best tattooers I know technically, but nobody knows him. His name is Lobinius, Brazilian. And he could literally teach drawing in, in university. He's that good. There's no technical fault in his drawing at all, ever. And he, he was explaining me, he was helping me with the design that I was doing, a Japanese koi dragon thing with a background. And he was explaining me how, like you, what you just said, you know, when you think about that wave, lots of people that don't quite understand that, they just place things on their own in different parts of the painting, right? So, oh, here, a few splashes. Yeah. But he was explaining me how you need to understand what generates that splash. And it's that energy of that thing that crash against the body and then splash that way and then the rocks. 
so you can actually read the energy especially because you know like the main the main top the main subject in the japanese is usually quite stiff and then it's the background that brings the movement you know when he said those things it really opened up the world and i'm like oh okay now everything has to make sense and not just place things you know in a certain place so it, I don't know, man. I feel grateful when I start to, I don't say they understand them, but I start to kind of see through a little bit over the years. And I'm so grateful because it, like any breakthrough in any profession, in any sport, craft, whatever that is, is so rewarding and enlightening. It gives you such a feel of, oh, wow, oh, there is an order behind everything, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, what are we doing when we're making art? You know, it's an expression of what, you know, and it's like, well, where do we come from? You know, what what are we trying to express? Power, energy, love, you know, like all these things that don't have actual pictorial reference. So like to get that message across, we use these like forms and symbols and shapes. And like what you're saying, you have to go to why the wave crashes there. And by doing that through our art and through our, our design, we're creating the narrative of what we're doing. You know, and I think that's really important. I think that gets lost. It's not just a visual representation of something. It's not all just aesthetics. There's something deeper, you know, and, and getting to the current or the root that brings us to make what we do. And that what would you say if you can think of some that are your favorite art movements or something that, that you saw that they influenced you? And you're like, oh, man, that really struck me because there's a few. I really like the Dada guys a lot the art poetry and the music of that time because it was it challenged everything and it turned everything upside down so i really like i like that stuff a lot um you mentioned the art brute thing in the u.s they refer to it more as outsider art i feel like it's almost the same thing but yeah uh, it has different names yeah yeah and uh it, it's funny because that wasn't really that's not really a movement it's something that's always kind of been there uh, as a folk form and it's funny how you see the similarities in a lot of it you know what i mean to these untrained artists um you know regionally you see it but then throughout the whole country and then the whole world you, you start to see like this beautiful stuff and then i, I talk a lot about the, the kaligat painters in india who were um painting deities at the bazaars it reminded me a lot of tattooing because they were making these paintings on the spot you know, maybe have an hour to make a, a painting, maybe 11 by 17 or 15 by 20. A lot of people would look at them as like they were kind of uh, rough or perhaps uh, naive. But to me, they really got to the core of the, the deity, you know, the expression that uh, actually what a deity should be kind of invoking in somebody. Um, and uh, just that, that they're doing it on the spot with people watching them. It reminded me a lot of tattooing. It's, I guess the time constriction maybe as well helped shaping their vision because then you really, you have to strip it to to still yeah. convey the message you know, because you have no time. Same with us, you know, with tattooing. The limitations have created this amazing aesthetic, this beautiful art form, you know. Like there's nothing outside of tattooing that looks like tattooing. We absorb so much of that outside stuff, you know, we're using outside reference and people, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of commission work and people are asking for stuff, but it always looks like a tattoo, no matter what tattooer does it, even if it's, they're trying to make it not look like a tattoo because of the application, it's still a tattoo. And, and through the limitation of skin, needles, pigment and pain, all the aspects just creates this look, you know. And one thing that I like the most, which I started, became even more obvious to me when I started doing these projects that I do, with the first one with the dolls that I did, when I started receiving all these artworks for the exhibition for so many artists, one thing that struck me when I saw them all together, because I had the advantage of actually having to handle them so I could see them all at once, is the fact that in each artwork, which is the same thing with every project, the artwork is the expression of the person. You know, what, what I mean is, uh, for example, I know a guy I used to work with, he has a very pronounced sense of humor. So he, he makes fun of everything all the time, right? So you could see that irony in his artwork. He was fucking with you as well in that thing. And then I know somebody else that is very uh, nerdy and controlled. So the artworks is very meticulous and perfect, you know? So I thought this is a beautiful display of humans through, you know, the reflection in their painting. And yeah. then you have somebody that is a pirate. So his stuff is just rough. 
And then, you know, somebody's an academic, so there is like very smart references. So, and it's like, oh, this is the beautiful representation of the fact that we're all different and all beautiful in different ways. You know, so obviously in your art and your artwork, there is you, you know. And the yeah. thing that struck me the most, obviously, in your stuff is your spiritual connection. How does that make part of, is part of your life? You know, um, I was aspiring to receive spiritual teachings for a long time, and I never really knew how to go about it. I started visiting temples at a pretty young age, but I was, I was approaching it in almost a lazy way, just kind of like sticking my toe in and not really ever committing to it. But then I, I, I met my teacher probably about 12 years ago and really started taking like I took initiation, started ta- making, a, you know, intense study a lot of these spiritual techniques that come mostly come from India. And uh, I was already painting a lot and I was already loved the, the painting of deities. But once I was able to kind of understand what I was what I was painting and what each you know, aspect each uh, story or what what the expression of that deity was kind of meant to invoke in the person that was looking at it, it really started kind of coming through in a different way that was far beyond me. You know, I was like, I was starting making paintings that I thought that I could never make. I was starting to get something more out of making them too, you know, and spending time with them. And they were starting to become more, I guess what was happening was it was starting to become part of more of my practice rather than just making a painting there was an intention that i was setting in each painting that wasn't there before that so that really changed the way that i approach things and it's growing with me more now than ever it's beautiful because it's almost like the the painting becomes the sub product of your personal journey of self-discovery rather than the main object Right. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's what I w- would hope that it would be. You know, um, I, I try not to be too attached to it once it's finished. And tattooing has taught me to do that real easily. We just let it go out the door once we're done. And yeah. same with the painting. Once the painting's done, you know, I don't have my own paintings hanging in my home or anything like that. I, I'm, I'm trying not to be too attached to the fruit, more to the root of what we're doing, you know, or that's in the Bhagavad Gita to do your duty but not to be attached to the outcomes of it, you know? That, that's one of my favorite uh, passage from the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. Know, because it's so, you can apply so much to to your intention, you know? And I, and I caught myself at times doing things, and even if you don't want to subconsciously, you're doing it, and then when you look into yourself, you see that, oh, actually, I'm getting stressed about this because I'm, I'm thinking subconsciously of what I'm going to get out of it. You know, if you develop that awareness, like, wait a second, you take a step back, and then you enjoy the fact that you're actually doing it for the sake of doing it. A good example of that, when you see that really, like when bands start to become popular and then they have to, they start considering their audience more and their music, uh, their record company or whatever. And it really, it hurts the music, it hurts the art. And I, I think that happens visually too. When people start painting for their audience or whatever and not, not what their true love might be. Um, but I do love sharing my paintings. You know, and I get a lot out of that because I hope that, you know, the things that I'm learning in this life and through a lot of these techniques and things like that, uh, you know, the the Dharma is to pass along. You know, that's what it means, the continuing of the teaching, you know, and what little I know of this teaching, I'm trying to help pass it along through my paintings. Nice. And uh, who, who would you say that... Uh influenced you or, or struck you the most in your career because obviously you grew up and, and you worked near new york which is such a vivid source of inspiration yeah. over the years so many people man there you know the the list is endless uh i'm constantly inspired by my friends and my peers and people that i don't know but i see and i love the work freddie corbin's been a huge inspiration to me his dedication to just being positive and putting love in what he does has been huge uh davida was it was probably my biggest inspiration um his necessity of making art i mean he just made art every day regardless of what was happening outside his periphery he made the art that he made and he stood behind it no matter what and you know he had influences but he took his influences and made it his own no matter what like if he was doing he would do sailor jerry designs or 
Mike Mullen designs, but it would always be Tom DeVita, you know, and I love that about, about him. Um, Scott Harrison's been a, a big influence on me in a lot more critical way of thinking because uh, he, he's like probably one of the best critics that I know. And I don't mean that in a negative way at all. He's just, he's, he's um, helped me to like kind of look at my own work a lot and uh, come from a different place and, and just having that, you know, having someone there. He's always kind of in the back of my mind of like, is this fucking cool or not? Because, <laughs> uh, Scott would hate this, you know? And then sometimes if, if I'm like, Scott would really hate this, then I'm definitely going to pursue it. Or if Scott <laughs> would hate this, I'm going to put it away. <laughs> nice. It's like a little, little devil angel on your shoulders. Yeah. Like, yeah. What is he thinking yeah. about it? Definitely. And, uh, you know, a lot, all these guys, it's, it's funny. And like Nick Bubash. So you have Davida, Nick Bubash, Higgs, Harrison. It is kind of the circle of these tattooers before it exploded in the, in the world. Those were That was like a small circle of these like kind of beatnik tattooers or like poetic tattooers, mm -hmm. I, I like to say. Just like guys that were not military tattooers or they weren't hot rod tattooers and they weren't, uh, they were just kind of following their, their vision, you know. Do you see some of that spirit? Uh, even in their own way in people's today, in some artists today? Yeah, I think um, Adam Shrewsbury definitely is following that kind of current. Um, I feel like Julian Bass and Jeff Zuck, those guys, all those like Michigan guys. And uh, it's cool because they, they've kind of gravitated around Leo Zuleta, who is like the keeper of the most primal form of tattooing ever, you know, and who is who's kind of like, To me, without Leo, you don't have tribal tattooing as it exists now. And yeah. even all those, none of those guys that I mentioned are known for being tribal tattooers or whatever. But the fact that they, they kind of have Leo there as almost their guru, quote unquote, would be, uh, you know, I think that that's really says a lot, you know, the same way that like Nick and Higgs and Scott served to teach me, they're learning from Leo. And then, like, all the guys at Temple and the people that come around the Temple scene uh, out in Oakland, you know, Freddie's kind of, like, the guy who's who's maintaining that spirit out there. I really like, uh, you know, obviously Steve Burns stuff and the guys at Rock of Ages and Tony and those guys. That's, like, a whole different, just, like, uh, talk about powerful tattooing, you know. Yeah. Incredible. It's beautiful because from what you say, what I get a little bit out of what you say is always that is this source, you know, yeah. in, fo in form of a person which shared this and then influence other people, which obviously, you know, they will absorb it and somebody eventually will carry that in their own way. And, you know, it gravitates about around one person, more or less. And it's, it's beautiful. Yeah. You know, um, one of my favorite places of pilgrimage is Varanasi, India. And there's a flame there that's uh, 5,000 years old, that's been maintained for 5,000 years. And that's the flame that they light all the funeral pyres, all the cremations come from that one source, flame. And I always think about that. Like, there is always a source, you know? Just the feeling of thinking, oh, this thing, it's an alive thing for 5,000 yeah. years. Or it must be just... Well, that to me, that's what the mantras are, too. You know, they're living and they're passed down mostly orally from teacher to student for this, for this long, you know, before there was written language, these mantras were being taught teacher to student, teacher to student. And, um, you know, in learning them, you know, it, it's really powerful to me. And throughout the mantra, as it builds inside you, it becomes part of you, you know, and uh, it, it's working inside your body physically, you know, it's kind of activating different things through, through different kinds of syllables, but mentally it's bringing your mind inward and then externally it's creating a, a peace outside of you, you know, so it, it serves as this living function, you know. It's like the original, you know, the original sound. Yeah. Like the definitely. creational. I was watching uh, something that Einstein was talking about and, and he was saying something about if you want to understand the universe, you had to think in terms of music. In terms of sound well that's what pythagoras taught you know and the pythagorean scale is the scale that we still use and that's a, a musical scale 
that was initiated by a scientist, you know? So th there's a science in sound, there's a science in color, all the arts, there's always that scientific. And with science, I think, you know, it, it's a shame that because the division in spirituality and religion has caused a, a division in science and spirituality and religion, you know what I mean? Yes. That like thousands of years ago, there wasn't, there wasn't that difference. And most of the, the original spiritual teachers were pursuing science as well. But now it's too, it's almost like it's this mutually exclusive thing, these two divided, you know, by fabricated thought processes, you know, and I think it, in that division, it causes a lot of division in the world, you know. Yeah, it, it's funny because, you know, it's basically talking about the same stuff with different words. You always arrive back at the same place. Yeah, also, creation, you know. Yeah, consciousness, yeah. which is something that they didn't even, you know, scientists wouldn't talk about up until now, this term of consciousness, you know, that, that came through quantum physics and things like that. But, um, you know, people have been questioning consciousness, you know, the, the great spiritual teachers have been questioning consci consciousness for thousands of years. And um, a lot of the Vedic philosophy is deeply, deeply steeped in a lot of science. And they didn't have the scientific tools at the time, which they were receiving their messages from somewhere else, which would be either the gods or revelation. Go, I think a lot of it was just from going inward and getting getting the knowledge, because the knowledge is in there. You just have to yeah. unlock it. And I think that's what the Rishis were doing. Um, but the division, I think, really is like when the priest craft kind of took over, you know, and when they made it like, you know, that the priests, had the knowledge and no one else really could you know what i mean like and that happened in all of them with the brahmins it happened you know in christianity it happened in islam with the with the different mullahs and stuff like that you know when it becomes a political thing the saddest thing is when i meet friends or people that we're going a bit off topic here but it doesn't matter we you know confuse religion with being religious yeah you know like dogma with the quest for understanding. And so it's sad because like you said, when they took over is because power system wanted to catalog those and, you know, become the sole proprietor, the sole owners of this to control people. You know? And then you forget the original message. It's sad because it's, it's different. You know? Yeah. And, and, and honestly, it's commodity when they come yeah. out of it, you know, and they make it a business, and that, uh, unfortunately, that happens with everything. Yeah. And let me ask you one thing. Is there anything you can think of, you know, an, an advice that somebody told you over, you know, doesn't matter, career or life, or, or an experience that you have, or a lesson you learned, something that got stuck with you, and you keep going back to that and helps you often? You know, something you learn or you've been told, and it got stuck with you, and it's like, man, that was the best advice I had. You know, I keep going to that, and it really helped me. Um, yeah. It's funny. Um, we had a client uh, that we, everybody at our shop, um, the first shop that me and Tom Yak and Mike Schweigert worked on, um, we all worked on this guy together. He, he was a great, great client. His name was uh, uh, Tommy Carbonero, Tommy Huck Carbonero. And uh, we knew that he was connected to organized crime, but we didn't know to what extent. And uh, we later found out that he was like, uh, one of the most notorious hitman for the for the Gotti family, you know, he, he, he was a he was a contract killer, but he was always super. Re, he was a really uh, probably one of our best clients. He got the coolest tattoos. He was always great to talk to. He always had, and he always impart this wisdom on us. And uh, he he told Tom, and I was there when he told him this. He finished his tattoo one of the first tattoos he did on him, he's like, you want a tip? And Tom's like, yeah, sure, I'll take a tip. And he said, simplicity is the essence of good taste. And uh. Uh, and we he left, and we just kept repeating it to each other, like, how about that? Simplicity is the essence of good taste. And from that moment on, everything that I've had that, like, my hot, the best food I've ever eaten always had this like kind of simplicity about it like my favorite pizza maker his name is anthony mangieri he, he learned in naples 
he, he's a Napolitanian pizza maker, but he lives in, here in New Jersey. Yeah. Um, he, he, he has four ingredients on his pizza, and it's the best pizza I've ever eaten because the intention and the simplicity and the love that's put in it. Um, with simplicity, you have purity, and that's what my teacher has a song that he sings, and it, it's simplicity is purity. And it, it goes along with the simplicity is the essence of good taste. So uh, simplicity, simplicity, simplicity is, is something that has always been it, it's a current that's been running through my life and it's something I need to be reminded of every day, you know, cause my mind always tries to complicate things, but like what we were talking about earlier with like Dan's designs or a great traditional tattoo design or a great Japanese tattoo design. When you boil it down to its core, the simplicity is, is purity. It's so, it's, it's such a beautiful man. That was more than a tip, man. That was a gift. Fact. Yeah, and, and, and yeah, it, it's a life lesson. And it yeah. came from a, a contract killer who's now uh, in jail for the rest of his life. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it's crazy, man. Uh, an anecdote to that story. Uh, I was getting on a train one day and I went to go take my seat on the train and there was the New York Daily News newspaper was there and his picture is on the front cover. <laughs> and uh and it said tattoo hitman on trial and they used his tattoos that i'd done on him quite a few of them that or that we had all done on him they were using his tattoos as evidence against him in this murder conspiracy because he had gotten a shotgun tattooed on his stomach those that tell don't know those, those that know don't tell tattooed uh, on him and uh he had rats get fat while good men die the seller so jerry flash and like um, I did a tattoo on him that said, fuck the U.S. government and their laws. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that was basically, you know, they, they used that against him in court. And uh, he would have probably been convicted anyway because people had turned state's evidence on him. But it was part of the, the case that they were building against him. But, man, nothing but love for me from that guy, despite the horrible things he might have done in his life. He really, I have that with me for the rest of my life. And, uh, it's beautiful, man. Yeah, I love those stories, man. When I when I started getting into tattoos and stuff, um, there was this man which I'm gonna send you a picture. You can Google it because this, the picture is a picture out of other other times, man. His name was Maurizio Fiorini, right? And he was now he passed years ago, but he was a, such a nice man. So I started hanging out at his shop, and you know you wouldn't necessarily learn how to tattoo and stuff, but you would learn what tattooing is. The shop was definitely what you would call old school because it was it was almost like a cave and you would have the craziest people going through there. Like people just came out of jail like two hours before and then come there and then someday cops would arrive and pick somebody up because he shot his wife apparently and they took him away. Fucking crazy, man. He was a friend with Herbert Hoffman. And, uh, and what he would do, he would sit on his chair, his barber chair with his military jacket because he was in the French Legion at some point, whatever. He would have his stick where inside he would have like a crazy knife. And uh, <laughs> crazy, he would tell you these stories over and over and over. And some of them were true, some of them were not. But he told them so many times that that became true. And right. there was the story, for example, like once when he tattooed like this mafia guy, right? And he said, man, I remember this guy forever because this guy never spoke a word ever, ever. And he just would come there with a design, give it to you, give you the money and, and never talk. And then he realized that this guy was a guy for the, working for the mafia. And when he got tattooed, he was a fish. And the fish, you know, in, within his circle, it mean, you know, fish don't talk. Yeah. You know, so it was his, you know, statement of like, I'm not a rat. And I'm like, man, I fucking love those stories, man. Because in, in the little simple tiny tattoo that is so much, you know, yeah. <laughs> there's a whole yeah. culture in there. Yeah? yeah. And the guy's whole life. You know, yeah. his entire life experience in that small fish. Yeah. You know? Fucking crazy. Um, that's what I love about tattoo shops and like what you're saying, like the, what you just described. To me, like tattoo shops were always the crossroads for all that. You'd meet any kind of different person and you get like, I, I read this great book um, called The Sorcerer's Apprentice. Are you f are familiar with that one? No. Uh, it, it's by a guy named Tahir Shah. And it's about a guy who goes, he studies Indian street magic and he meets this street magician and his first uh, lesson, he, he sends him out 
and he's like, go find out about insider information about all these different things. So he talks to a grave, a guy who works uh, digging graves. He he, uh, talk, he he talks to a guy that runs a wig factory that they're making wigs out of human hair. Wow. Um, he talks to a guy that makes perfume, and he uh, he talks to this rickshaw driver, and he's getting all this information about their crafts. But each thing he's learning by talking to all these different people is increasing his magical ability. Mm. And uh, I feel like tattooing, that's one of the, the advantages of a tattooer. You're meeting all these people. You're getting to know all this stuff. Like tattooers know a little bit about everything. Like, yeah. you know, anybody that pays attention to their clients, they know a little bit about everything because you've tattooed every kind of person over the last 20 years. You know, I know a little bit about plumbing, electricity, you know, electricity, yeah. and, you know, uh, not enough to, for it to be useful, but uh, you do get this little bit of insider information. And I think that little bit of information can inform what we do. And uh, it really kind of makes up what we do as a craft and as artists, too. Yeah, it's definitely a bliss in that sense. And let me ask you one last thing. Um, sure. If somehow you could go back, right, and talk to your yourself when you were like 15, 16 or something, so, sort of like before your real life started, right, and tell yourself with what you know now as sort of an advice, what would you tell yourself? Turn the mind inward. <laughs> all, all the shit that's happening out here it's nothing go inward anything you need to know is in here unlock that you know that that's my advice it's like one of those things where i'm still turning the mind outward and getting caught up in what's happening out here but if i had learned back then it would be a lot easier for me to do it now <laughs> to feel to it yeah <laughs> you know what i'm saying so it's yeah. like uh it'd be like breaking that uh, breaking a habit back you know when i was 16 um, but I feel like a lot of those kind of like life lessons, they develop over time and you have to go through those experiences for you to act, for them to actually take root. You know, you have to water that plant before it flourishes. So I could go back and uh, tell my 16 year old self to turn my mind inward. I probably still wouldn't have listened. <laughs> <laughs> awesome robert this was great thank you for the for the nice talk man we touched so many things oh man it's so nice to talk to you this is like the, one of the, the highlights of my quarantine <laughs> <laughs> yeah same for me this is the most i've talked to anybody in a while. <laughs> yeah i'm locked in as well by myself so it's like fuck man sometimes i talk to a chair and i'm like yeah you're doing <laughs> well this Always is great man. let me know what, what's going to happen with it and it's really good talking with you man and i can't wait to see you in person hopefully thank you man are you coming to europe at some point yeah if everything goes as planned i'll be back on the t travel tattoo tour we'll oh, see nice. feeling, you know uh where do you knock in last year was that yeah yeah oh nice yeah i was there too yeah so we'll be we'll be coming back um i know that the Aachen convention was canceled but we're gonna uh continue to tattoo at, at the shop at his place there Nice. So, so you're still going there if you can, like, and everything works out at the same time kind of thing. We're planning for it, you know, God willing, how any of this is going to pan out. But we're all planning on, on doing the tour if uh, if we're allowed to do it. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, hopefully I see you there. Thanks, man. I can't wait to he hear it and uh, hear the other ones you're doing. Awesome. Thank you very much. Well, enjoy the rest of this hopefully not too long quarantine. Yeah, you, you too, man. Cheers, bro. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.